Vsauce! I'm Jake and welcome to my house. I'm still living that quarantine life so I can't do the kinds of videos I usually make that require other people with me to create. So I've been spending a lot of time on my new computer streaming on Twitch, making videos on my personal channel. I won an Emmy, by the way, for my show Could You Survive the Movies, but you already know that because you're subscribed to my personal channel. <laughs> okay, all right. And I've been looking at a lot of dongs, things you can do online now, guys. But before we get into the dongs, let me show you my computer. <gasps> Origin PC sent me this as my editing gaming rig, and it is really powerful. And it turns out that it is not the most powerful supercomputer in the world because there is no singular machine that achieves that status. Instead, it's computers like mine, like yours, like hundreds of thousands of ones all around the planet, all working in concert, running Folding at Home. Folding at Home uses distributed computing, that is individual separate computers all working together to solve problems, specifically to give scientists access to a significant amount of computing power to simulate protein dynamics like protein folding, and the movements of proteins implicated in diseases, well, such as Alzheimer's, cystic fibrosis, various cancers, and most recently, COVID-19. Folding at home uses your CPU and GPU to do those calculations. And it recently became the most powerful supercomputer in the world, reaching 1.5 exaflops, meaning it can perform 1.5 quintillion calculations every second and it has led to 233 research papers being published with the data that citizen scientists, people like you and I, helped calculate by contributing our computers. You know, our thinking of what a computer is has changed over time. For myself, a computer was a relatively large rectangular box you kept under a desk at home, or it was something portable like a laptop. Then it became a device a lot of us carry in our pocket or even on our wrist, but the truth is, we are surrounded by computers most of the time, even though they might not look or function how we think they should. A microwave is a computer, so is an oven, an electric toothbrush, a standard digital watch, a digital meat thermometer, stoplights, modern cars, this camera I'm recording on. Heck, even a digital pregnancy test is a computer. Phone on Twitter took one apart and found that the processor inside runs at four megahertz. That's faster than the Apollo guidance computer that got us to the moon. They were even able to get Doom playing on the screen after some more hacking. I highly recommend checking out the entire thread because it is amazing. But back to the topic at hand. The dictionary classifies a computer as a programmable electronic device that can store, retrieve, and process data. So everything I just rattled off makes sense. And it is interesting. In researching for this episode, I watched a lot of old informational videos about computers and they kept introducing the machines as the electronic computer. But why? Why the adjective electronic before computer? Well, if we go to the dictionary, this one from 1828, a computer was defined as one who computes because before the digital age, this was a computer. All of those photos are from NASA's Human Computer Archive, which is a wonderful resource to explore. But back in the day, and by that I mean up until the 1970s, when electronic computers became more affordable, they were people. It was a job title, a job where you did mathematical equations and calculations by hand. They were incredibly important in the space race, war, typically calculating artillery trajectories, and for astronomy. I mean, in the 1750s, three human computers were able to calculate and predict the return of Halley's Comet, and we're only off by two days. Doing this kind of work was immensely time-consuming, and there was a massive difference between calculation by hand and calculation by machine. For example, the first electronic calculator to be completed could do the work of 50,000 people working by hand. Electronic computers were created as a tool to help us solve problems, specifically around mathematics and counting, but they weren't the first tools humans used. The abacus was the earliest computing device that we know of. It dates back to about 3,000 years ago, and if you've never played with one before, here's a quick rundown. From right to left, you have ones, tens, one hundredths, and so on. 
The top beads represent a value of 5, and the bottom beads represent a value of 1. If we wanted to find out what 1,267 plus 5,198 was, well, we first input 1267, and then start adding 5198 from the left. 1 plus 5 is 6, 2 plus 1 is 3, 9 plus 6 is 15, and we carry the 1 over to the hundreds position. 7 plus 8 is also 15, so we carry that other one to the tens position, and we get 6,465. We did basic addition. The abacus was used for subtraction, multiplication, division, and basic accounting needs. And yes, it might seem a bit simplistic to us as a calculator now, but you can imagine how valuable a tool like this was. But as with everything, our ambition and understanding of math became greater, which led to more problems and we needed more sophisticated tools to solve them. Napier's bones were invented in 1617 by mathematician John Napier, the same dude who discovered logarithms. What made Napier's bones such a huge leap forward over the abacus was while it could do all the same kind of calculations as an abacus, it could also do square and cube roots. So let's take a look at this simulator and do a quick multiplication problem. Choose a four digit number. Okay, 6735, good choice. Now let's multiply it by six. We go down to six and this makes it so easy. The first number we see next to the six is the first digit of our answer, three. Then we add six plus four, carry the one to our three, add two plus one, then eight plus three and carry the one over. And then this number is your final digit and boom, our answer is 40,410. Now a few years after the invention of Napier's bones came the slide rule or the slip stick. And you've probably seen one before and people still use them because they are awesome. They can do multiplication, division, exponents, roots, logarithms, trigonometry, and one of my favorite features, conversions. If we flip the slide rule over, you're given a lot of options. Let's see what five miles is in kilometers. Well, just over eight. Handy. And if you want to become a master of the slide rule, there is this necessary and very in-depth guide to help. Okay, so we've had computing devices, albeit non-electronic ones, for a very long while, but the issue that kept coming up was time. While these devices we just played around with made solving problems faster, it still wasn't fast enough as problems became larger and significantly more complicated. As the video clip said earlier, the first electronic computer could do the work of 50,000 people working by hand, which is what spurred the computer revolution. One thing I'd, I'd really like to point out from those clips is just how massive a computer used to be. A typical card system user had key punches, verifiers, collators, sorters, reproducing punches, accumulating reproducers, interpreters, accounting machines, and a calculator with attached punch and storage units. Not only were computers huge, like take up an entire room big, but early computers could only run one program at a time, and for the most part, you couldn't store said program on the computer. It had to be ingested physically into the machine every time you wanted to run it using the most common form at the time, punched cards. virtual card read punch, we can see what that process was like. Now, before even getting to the punch stage, you would write your code out in longhand, then punch it on the cards. Now, each card represents one line of code. The more involved your program was, the more cards you'd need. Once finished with that, take it over to read, so your program can be ingested into the system. If that is successful, it can be executed. And look at that! We have a game of tic-tac-toe. All right. Some programs would be so large that the punch cards necessary to run it would fill an entire box. And to get that program out, a person would physically have to get the box and unpack it. Just like how a modern computer will unpack an application or a folder. But a huge limitation to the tool that is the electronic computer was, like I said a moment ago, that it could only run one program at a time, could only solve one problem at a time. So something had to be changed. Computers have become so fast internally that they must be operated by special programs called operating systems, which enable the simultaneous processing of many jobs. The operating system! We did it! And we interact with them or view them in a much different way than their initial 
purpose, because an operating system, as the name suggests, allows the system to do multiple operations at once. And this was huge. No longer would one programmer have to wait for another programmer's program to finish. They could be running at the same time. And in case you're not a fossil like me, let's check out some old operating systems. PCJS has a myriad of OSs you can emulate. Let's check out the very first public release of Microsoft Windows. Wow. But it does have a calculator and paint, so that's good. Now let's skip ahead and check out Windows 95, which is notable because it introduced the start menu, notifications, taskbar, and the desktop, which is commonplace on pretty much every current operating system. I would highly recommend exploring this site a bit. Not only are there a bunch of OSs to check out, but you can also find old games like Wolfenstein 3D and Commander Keen. Computers have only become more intuitive, faster, smaller, and more affordable over time, and not even that long of a time. I mean, your cell phone is tens of thousands of times faster than the first home computers. And my watch is faster than the first computer I built when I was 14. And this beast of a machine has a CPU with 32 cores and a Titan RTX. And all of this reminds me of a quote from one of those old educational computer videos that I've been watching. We first used computers to simulate situations in engineering, situations which we had been doing before by hand. The computer has allowed us to do much larger and more complex problems. We are now beginning to use the machines in entirely new ways on entirely different problems. And this is the exciting part. This is the intellectual aspect of applying the machines to completely new ideas that has so excited many people in the field. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are using our computers in ways that the initial programmers and users could have only dreamed of. We can connect to one another in new ways. We can solve problems in new ways and solve new problems. Now, I want to go back to the beginning with the very first dong, folding it home, because to me, that is one of the best examples of the power of computers. It's accessibility. Future solutions, future discoveries won't be done by just one individual, by one person. It will be done by a collective of people, all working together, using tools they have to solve mysteries and problems that could have never been solved before. You know, I started using Folding at Home back on my PlayStation 3, and we all have the opportunity now to be citizen scientists, to use our tools to help others. And I love that. All right, links to everything can be found in the description below, and I'm going to leave you with one last clip from the video Logic by Machine. Stay safe, and as always, thanks for watching. The lifetime of all mankind is but a brief moment in the long history of this earth of ours, and only yesterday in the history of mankind has man made any significant advance in his control over his earthly environment. Computers, machines for logic, may change this more than any other of man's inventions. These machines, which have been with us less than a millionth of a second in terms of the temporal span of man's history, have already given promise of deep and far-reaching change in our way of life and way of thinking. They literally accelerate into milliseconds of time our ability to perform logical, arithmetic, and control tasks. But finally, the future, except in terms of trends and probabilities, is the great unknown. And the uses to which we put ourselves in relation to the marvelous machines of our own invention is perhaps the central moral and intellectual challenge of our own brief moment in time.